as it was said, this presentation is about running a public facing service and I have been made aware that this is not a good title, so I'm sorry about that. What I meant by that is a service that is running and available to the public for 27 years, uh, an internet service. Um, 27 years and counting since it's still working. Uh, but first, thank you for the presentation. I rarely use this description, but today I decided that I should tell two things here. One of them is that I was born in 82, and I'm just saying that because I want to put what 27 years is in perspective. And also that I, th this is usually the blurb I have on social media and so on, but I rarely use it. And I rarely speak about being a virt virtual world god, and that's what this presentation is actually about. So, 27 years ago, well, a long time ago there was nothing, and then came the internet. But the internet, which nowadays we all think about as something you just have on your pockets or have anywhere, or even the fact that you can have it at home and that you work and your entirely daily work is happening while you are on an internet connected device is something fairly recent. In Portugal, the University of Lisboa was the first um, organization with an internet connection, then came the University of Minho, um, and by uh, 1990, the Portuguese Unix Users Group um, started for the first time commercializing internet connections. So only since the uh, 1990 that we have someone selling somewhat related to what you now think of an internet connection. Um, two years ago, was 27 years ago. So 27 years ago, when the service I'm going to talk about started, was the same year that uh, started the registration of domains for the Portuguese TLD, and it was the, the same year as the first web server was run in Portugal. This is a screenshot, or well, this is a screenshot of a copy of a login screen from 1994. 1994, if you wanted to buy an internet connection in Portugal, you would be buying it from UNET, which was basically run by the Portuguese Unix group. And <laughs> this is what was to connect to the internet by then you didn't have a service where you could make a call with your modem and just get a public IP. That didn't happen at all. What you had was you would have a connection to one machine only, which was this machine that would give you this login screen. And then you would press a key after connecting to this machine you would press a key and you would be offered a login um, screen that would allow you to use, choose from and, and use one of different um, programs that were connected to the internet. You have a Gopher browser. You even have a www browser. But remember, you, were, you, you didn't have a browser on your machine. You were connecting to this machine and this machine would give you access to a, to a web browser. This was 94. But before that, in 1991, two guys that worked on one of the universities that have an internet connection already, found out about a service called a DS9. You might even imagine what this, does this mean, since uh, it was, uh, Starbase, 
because DS9 was a text-based virtual world. It was a virtual world, it was text-based as everything was, as you seen just in, in the previous screen, and it was run in a university too, of course, but in the United States. Being in the United States, it had a bit, a number of problems that you would not feel nowadays. Problems like the fact that you wanted to have and maintain a, a reliable connection to a United St States server wasn't easy. To be able to just create a TCP connection from Portugal to, to the United States and think, oh, I'm going to be logged on in here for three straight hours without the connection dropping, good luck with that. Then you have things like the fact that the internet was the world of academics. So if you wanted to connect to the internet, you were probably working on a an university or studying in a an university. And that also means that at that time you didn't have 24-7 uh, computer rooms <laughs> available. So what you had uh, was a very tight linear schedule on when would you be able to use a terminal and that meant work hours. So when in Portugal these two guys were connected, it was at night in the United States. So while they had access to a virtual world, most of the people from the United States that were in there weren't actually online at that time. Finally, uh, well, not finally, still one, some, one thing that I don't have here, I, I, I do in the, the first item, I'm sorry about that, but um, internet connections weren't just unreliable. If you had a server in Portugal and you were connecting to it from Portugal, you would have a screen where your characters will show up one by one on your terminal. Now imagine connecting to the United States. It was very, very slow, sluggish. It wasn't the best ideal user experience at all. So, uh, and finally, knowledge and comfort with the English language was very different at that time that it is now for Portuguese people. Now you see uh, kids going into the university, they all know how to speak in English. Uh, when I went to the university, there was an English course within, in the university because it was accepted that many of the students enrolling a, a technological course didn't know English at all. So of course, Portuguese people speaking in English on a uh, on an service on the United States, most of, or there, there were many conflicts regarding the fact that the Portuguese English was very rudimentary, let's say like that. So basically in 1992, um, by the summer, the guys from the United States told the guys from Portugal, okay, you guys are cool, but there's all these problems regarding having you guys here, so why don't you get a copy of our code and run your own service in Portugal? And in October 1992, Cyber Eden, which was a space station too at that time, was created. Cyber Eden is Portugal Virtual, which then became Selfie Virtual, and is the, this service I'm going to talk to you about, which is running for 27 years. It was inaugurated on the 1st of October, so 27 years and 10 days now. Um, and in the meantime, time passes. There was a boom of talkers. By the way, talker is the name that is given to these kind of um, text-based uh, virtual worlds. And if Portugal Virtual, uh, Portugal Virtual, uh, Cyber Eden then renamed Portugal Virtual, was the first uh, Portuguese talker, 
the fact is that we actually managed to have, at some point, more than 100 of these virtual worlds uh, running in Portugal. Uh, here's a very old screenshot of a very old uh, website listing some of the Portuguese talkers that existed at some point. Um, and talkers used to be running on university servers and obviously not with permission from the university. But still, they happened. There were even some articles about them and not always about the nicest things about this. So for instance, this is a Portuguese uh, article about how you can uh, meet your dates online and how kids were sp spending time on the internet in front of the computer instead of meeting people in real world. Um, and this boom of talkers happened, including one called Selva, uh, which was created in 1990, uh, uh, 1998. It was banned in 1998 from the university server that was running, so it changed it to a second one. And then it's, this is the, already in 1999, the web page, very 1999-ish. <laughs> um, and this is just one other of, the, of, of those virtual worlds. And I joined it and I, I met personally these text-based virtual worlds in 1999, thanks to Selva. Um, I'm, okay, um, Selva kept going on. It had several versions. Um, I'm, in 1999, it was with version two. I found it at that time. I got really engaged in it. I found it very cool. I thought it should be even cooler. I decided I should code for something like that, so I decided to create my own talker. And well, we had hundreds, so I created one more. And then the guy, the guy running, the major guy running Selva at that time, decided to, he, he was studying on the same university that I was, so he just went to me, hey, you are doing this cool stuff, why don't you do it on Selva instead of creating our own? So we merged them together, and then Selva 3 showed up, and from then to 4 and 5, and 5 was the last Selva version. So in the meantime, Portugal Virtual, which was cyber Eden, as we saw in 92, it was running on a, uh, on a, a university here in Lisbon. The system administrator said, no, no, no. So they just packed up the code, sent the code by mail, and I'm not saying email, by mail. They sent <laughs> the code to Coimbra, where there was one of the Portuguese, Portugal virtual users, um, that had a position in the university and was fairly certain he would be able to run it on one of the servers without being disturbed, decided to run it there. And that's why, why, when uh, Cyberism was renamed to Portugal Virtual. Um, and it ran in different servers in different places along the time until 2006 when they lost all uh, interest and availability from any uh, university to keep hosting it. And so um, the person behind or taking care of Portugal Virtual at that time, which had several people taking care of it along the time, but at that time it was uh, a guy that told me, okay, you are running Selva, please also run Portugal Virtual because I don't have uh, the means to do it. I don't want to see it die. And I kept uh, maintaining it. Um, I kept maintaining it until today. But at some point, I 
stop us having the means to have two different servers in two different hosting sites and so on. So uh, at some point I just had to put both services running on the same machine. And when I had, I had the possibility to having them running on the same machine, I also thought, okay, this is silly now because if when one of the services is down for some reason, the other also is, I, I'm just having trouble uh, and spending time maintaining two code bases and maintaining two different services doing the same kind of stuff. So I just decided to merge both and instead of Portugal Virtual and Selva, now we have Selva Virtual which is the merge of the two and it's the only talker nowadays running in Portugal but it's still running and it's still evolving. We are still doing new functionalities in a very slow way but we are still catering to our users and we still have users which, is, which means we are here for 27 years but we are planning on still counting them. Okay, so I'm talking about this thing, so let's try it, right? This is the login screen and nowadays you don't need to tell net to a server anymore, so that's still the major um, way of connecting to this service. You tell net to a, an IP and a port, but you can also um, run Telnet SSL, basically having, it's the same as having HTTPS instead of just HTTP. Uh, and we also have this you are seeing, which is a web client that basically just actually Telnets to the service, but you can do it on your browser without having to know how to use Telnet or whatever. And this year we also implemented a Telegram bot, so if you don't want to connect via browser but you want to connect via Telegram, you also can. So this is a talker, what happens is you can, it's asking you for a name, you can choose a name and go from there. You can also issue a few comments here, for instance, the who comments which will let you know that at this moment there are two users logged in. Um, these are their names, these are their locations, since this is a virtual world, so you have several places where you can be at. Um, maybe, maybe I'll have some time to explore this further, but this is the link, so feel free to your, explore yourselves. Um, all right. There are challenges, and we met several ch challenges along the way. For instance, the color challenge. The color challenge is lots of things. If you are thinking about 1992 or if you are thinking about 2012, it's different. And it's different because at the beginning, most of the users of a talker didn't have color capability at all. And when they started having terminals with color and then you had actual PCs connecting to these guys, to, 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 to these uh, sorts of, of services, um, you had color capability but you had to be um, assured that terminals without color would still be able to connect and work properly. Um, there were other challenges from a social nature. For instance, while Selva had color since the first version in 1998, Portugal Virtual only had color from 20, uh, 2005 onwards, basically because the users didn't want it. The users were used to have uh, black and white or green and white or whatever you have your terminal configured at, so they don't really want, they didn't really want color. But more than that, implementing color even today is a big challenge. For instance, this is, the this is 
ANC colors, okay? ANC colors, there's nothing more basic than this. You have white and cyan and red and green and yellow, and everyone knows what yellow is, right? So if you think I'm going to paint, in, paint this in yellow, you just code it to spit out yellow and it should show you yellow. And yet, we are in 2019. If you decide to paint yellow on Windows PowerShell, you will get this color. I see white. I'm not sure what do you see, but I see white in here. Okay? Each of these rows is the implementation of AC color on a different system, and as you can see, no one agrees on what is yellow or what is blue or whatever. For instance, the last column is Ubuntu, and while I like Ubuntu, I have to say, guys, it's very cool that you want to have pretty colors, but please don't redefine what cyan is to make a more beautiful cyan, because then if I want to paint something on ASCII, I can't. I can't because I'm trying to use yellow and I get an orange. I want to use blue and I get a weird thing. I'm sorry, but this pinkish blue, whatever. It's pretty when you open your console, but if a coder decides they want to print red, show them red, please. There are more challenges. I've talked about the fact that we have the SSL connection. Actually, I also said that we added a Telegram support this year, and one of the reasons we did the Telegram bot was because I am trying for more than a decade to convince people to use something other than Telnet. Telnet was the first uh, way to connect to this service, but the fact that we have a Telnet port open means that some people will still use Telnet, and Telnet is just insecure. It's plain text going over the web, so if you are talking with someone, someone can snoop you. Just oh, remember that online, da uh, online dating thing from the 90s? Now imagine online dating on the clear. It's not cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, I want people to stop using just Telnet. And actually, I did the grave mistake of deciding to shut down the Telnet port on Selva in, back in 2003. You know what happened? I stopped having users. I lost 90% of the users because they didn't want a worse client just because it had SSL support. And then the, the rest of the users decided there's no point coming here if there are no users at all. So they also start, stop us going on, uh, connecting. So I had to revert the decision and there's Telnet again. But the problem is here, basically. This is, again, 2019. These are uh, clients and this last row it, the, the greens are clients that have security support, TLS in this case, and the reds, they don't have support. This is like browsers that don't support HTTPS. Imagine the parallel. It, this is not a com complete uh, table, but gives you a good example of how many of these still don't support uh, security. There was the hosting challenge. Basically, you, initially, people were just hosting them on um, universities without really having any, any sort of um, permission to do so. They were just doing it until they were found and shut down. Um, things started uh, evolving, but hosting alternatives, nowadays you can buy a VPS for $3, I know that. But 10 years ago you couldn't, and 20 years ago it was very, very difficult to find any sort of hosting. Especially hosting that would allow you to open a port which, which wasn't one of the usual ports. So it wasn't mail or web or something they knew what, 
it was about, you had those ports blocked, basically. Um, things changed slowly. There was um, a guy running a, actually um, a service dedicated to providing hosting to talkers. It closed in 2009 and talkers started dying by then. Um, this was the third to last dedicated server. As you can see, maybe, this is a Spark station. Um, and one of the interesting things about the code that now was as is protocol virtual is that this is basically the same code, code of Evolved for 27 years, but it's still running the same code. And this is the code that was, that ran on non-Unix operating systems and on many, many, many variants of Unix operating systems. It ran on System 5, APUX, um, it ran on macOS, it ran on BOS, it ran on every variant I can think of BSD that existed 10 years ago. It ran on many different hardware and operating system configurations along the time. There was a, a point when it was running on a hosting system running NetBSD where we had a quota of two megs. Two megs had needed to have mail configuration, user data, the server code, and the server compiled and running. And if it did pass two megabytes, no more user data being written on the disk. Um, this, uh, I like this picture a bit more because this is not one server, but two servers uh, from Selva. Because basically, at some point, we were on the data center and we had this machine on the outside occupying one rack. And then when this server um, stopped leaving, um, and we decided to change the server, we actually got a Raspberry Pi, which is the small transparent box, which is here connected to a network cable. So now we have a Raspberry Pi, it does exactly what we want, but I need to put this on a data center, and I'm not going to leave it dangling in there because someone is going just to pass and take the server and put it on the pocket, right? So basically what I did was I tried to make it look like the outside box is actually the server in there running, but there was just a power cable and network cable going into the box and I, wa I had the Raspberry Pi dangling in here and doing all the work. Um, more challenges that we had along the time. Uh, especially when people started leaving the university and going to work in the offices but still wanting to connect to the, to the, the service, they have weird ports blocked, for instance. You could use uh, the web, but you couldn't connect to the random port 9999 or 6969, which was the ports for Selva and Protocol Virtual at, at some time. Uh, at some point in time. So, um, we had several changes in trying to allowing users to still be able to connect. There was stuff like uh, people connecting from home meant, well, first, the fact that the way how universities started to actually managing their university park as any other, uh, well, companies now do nowadays and so on, instead of being just random stuff that geeks use it and no one really knew about what's going on in there. Um, people connecting from home raised another challenge. Then uh, connecting from home because there are blocked ports because they cannot install 
uh, a telnet client or whatever they might need, or they are forced to use what's in there. Um, so basically, most of these were solved or tentatively solved progressively with the use of web clients. And if we now have that web client you saw earlier, uh, before that we had uh, Java clients and Flash clients and whatever, but the problem is always that there's always someone that cannot make that connection because you are connecting to a weird port or because you are using a plugin that isn't installed or allowed or whatever. Fortunately, nowadays we are able to be running on standard ports, so we have that interface you saw running on HTTPS on the standard 443 port, which makes many people be able to connect to there. But if you see the, <laughs> the address we had in there, if I can show you the address we had in there, it's um, selva.grog dot org and grog being uh, alcoholic beverage means that some web server uh, blocking content configurations on some companies don't allow you to visit this site because they say oh no if it has alcoholic beverage name in the URL then you probably can't see this so we have other uh, <laughs> other domain names pointing to the same place like portugal-virtual.org which will allow you to connect there in this, and avoid it by just using a different address. Um, and well, that's basically it. Nowadays, this service is still running on a Raspberry Pi. It's not the same as you can see, but it's still a Raspberry Pi. It's the first version of Raspberry Pi because as old as it might be, it still does the work correctly and we are still aiming to run is, with a zero money budget. So if, if, if I don't have to buy a server for this, perfect. Someone gave me a uh, old Raspberry Pi because they bought the two or three or whatever, it works. The problem with these machines, and as you can see, it's not the first Raspberry Pi that I am using for this service. The problem with these machines in particular, the first version for me is only that um, it ruins uh, flash drives with a very fast speed. It's incredible. The number of times we had the service down because I, it just stops the the flash drive just stops uh, writing. You could still read and connect to the machine and everything, but you, you stop uh, having the capability of writing to the to the flash. And they all, I, I never had a problem with this that wasn't that problem. So I, I'm on the sixth, I think flash drive, since I started using Raspberry Pis, they all die in the same way. Um, someone was talking uh, on the Ubuntu Portuguese community about how bad the Unix way is and how outdated it is, so I decided to write here the Unix way. This is how I am running this service. Usually, and if you go to see uh, code bases for running uh, text-based services, you will see lots of solutions that are uh, one daemon to do everything. You have, you want webs, uh, you want a net web interface, you code the web interface within. You want to support uh, SSL, you code the support within, and so on. I decided to do it differently. Well, nowadays, I learned it with my previous mistakes and nowadays we are doing it differently. So, I have the core server that just does the actual virtual role text-based thing. Then, if you want to connect it via TCP and we have several different TCP ports connecting to it, we just use TCP server that only does that deals with TCP connections. 
if we want uh, SSL or TLS nowadays, we use external that only does that. It receives your connection with SSL, takes the SSL wrapping over and delivers it to the actual service. On the web client, as you saw, it also connects via Telnet, but actually using the Telnet SSL uh, client, which is, well, on Ubuntu, because it's based on Debian, you have two packages, two possible um, Telnet clients, which is the Telnet package and the Telnet SSL package. They are basically the same base code, but the Telnet SSL also supports SSL as that, and they are two different packages, but they could actually be just the same one with a compiler flag or something like that, but it's not. And I'm use, for this case, I could use just Telnet because it's local, but I'm using the Telnet SSL client because I'm using a fork of the um, Debian client because I, had, I added some support for Unicode, some better support for Unicode that is still not merged on um, Debian's version. Uh, shell in the box is the shell on the web client that I'm using for the web connection. So that client you saw in there is basically something that just runs a shell and the shell is running Telnet and connecting inside. So I no longer have to maintain a web server. I'm using just something stock and configuring it that way. For the Telegram bot, I'm using uh, Midgard bot, which is also uh, an open source solution that really just makes a Telnet connection. Um, there is a bot within the, the actual virtual world, and for that, I am using NetsBot, which is code that I wrote and I publishes open source. It, it, the, the actual bot then uses several um, free software things to do several th different things. I don't really need to enumerate here everything, but basically the lesson here is the Unix way is writing very small pieces of software that are very good at doing what they do and at communicating with other processes. Unix gives you process communication as no one, no one else did back in the 70s, it's still true now, and you can just pipe and make lots of different tools communicate with each other, which has the advantage of if today I want, and I do want, to replace one of the, one of the components, I can just replace it, but if it still works the Unix way, it will connect to everything else, and that's it. So we have users, because you are seeing lots of talk about uh, text-based virtual world and you have to realize but who the hell uses it. So yeah, we have people using it. This is our top 40, if, if I'm not mistaken. And for instance, our bot is alive for six years and I have five years of real time spent inside the virtual world, which is actually, well, this was reset, resetted back in 2002, so since 2002, I spent more than five years of my life connected in here. It may mean something about how crazy <laughs> I am, I'm not sure, sorry about that. This is a graphic that you cannot actually see inside the virtual world, so I just took a screenshot you can see the weird colors, it's Ubuntu's fault, okay? This, this is Ubuntu yellow, okay? This is yellow in Ubuntu. Uh, so we have, in 2018 we had a drop, as you can see, but I'm not concerned because since we have the new uh, Telegram interface, we had a boom of people connecting again because it's, modern, and there's a modern way of going into it. Uh, so I, I, I think this 
this is going to get, get another spike here for, for this year, I'm confident. We have current challenges. For instance, if there is a power failure, and we had one of those recently, on where the, the server is at the point that the UPS loses power, and the server reboots, everything is going to be uh, raised up automatically, but the external interface, because there's a bug since 2007 on the Ubuntu package, on, on the Debian package. Oh, I'm running this on Raspberry Pi, so I'm running it with uh, Raspbian, which is the Debian version for uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, we use Telnet SSL, but the Telnet client on Debian doesn't cope well with UTF-8. There's a bug since 2005. There's a bug on Telnet that there's a fix, uh, there's a patch. I maintain a fork of it just because of this bug since 2005, but the Debian developers don't have the uh, incentive to take a look at this uh, issue since, well, who the hell uses Telnet nowadays, right? That's my problem. Python 2 is going to reach its end of life, so I have to migrate uh, the bot talker, the Hatai talker, the Hatai bot, which is written on Python 2. I'm still, I need to spend some time migrating it to Python 3. Uh, I want to replace the talker base because the talker base is really, really very old. It, it has code, it still has code from 96, which also means that it really isn't designed, it's C code, and it's really not designed to deal with uh, UTF, for instance. Um, and really, I mean, I reached the point where actually fixing the bugs instead of rewriting the whole thing is no longer a, an option anymore. I, I'm, I'm I'm really delaying writing new features or fixing things because every time I look at that code, I think, no, I really need the new code base. There was nothing actively being developed, so I started developing Talker Node very slowly, but it is reaching a point when I think it's, it still doesn't have feature parity, but it's reaching a point when I think, okay, it's ready for me to be able to, on that, Unique way of doing things, I can just plug out memnets, plug in talker note, and it will work with loss of functionality. But, well, if anyone wants to contribute with JavaScript code, you are welcome. We have issues in here. Things are more or less well documented, so bring it on. The Telegram bot that I'm using, I actually found someone that said, oh, I wrote this thing, this is very cool. And here's the code. And the code was a link pointing to a Git server that wasn't even online anymore. So I searched for the name he gave to the project on GitHub, and I found that someone had cloned it and posted it on GitHub. So I started using, the, using it and I started realizing it, ha it had bugs and missing features and creating issues and even a pull request and got zero feedback so far. So it's really just a clone, but the guy that did the clone isn't interested in maintaining it. So nowadays I'm convinced that sooner or later I will need to start maintaining this myself. Uh, unless someone needs to or wants to play with some Go code in that case, feel free to contribute. Um, then there's the web client. I'm using Shell in the Box, as I said before. It's nice. It also has several problems. And there is, there are very, way more modern and better alternatives. However, there is a reason why I chose um, what I'm using now for some, uh, for, from some time now, which is the fact that it doesn't just use WebSockets. 
It uses WebSockets, but if you, your browser doesn't support it, it still works on your browser. And if nowadays there are not so many Internet Explorer installations out there and so on, still I am not convinced that our users that come in, log in from their workstation and where they don't have access to the possibility of installing a browser or updating a browser and so on, I don't want to use those users. So I have been debating for half an year now when is the good time to study migrating to another solution that only supports WebSockets but does the work better. Um, there's also the new copyright reform, which will force me to change some things. I'm not sure exactly how many, but if people think that co the copyright reform is something that only affects musicians and so on, think again. If you are hosting a service, it's quite probable that this is going to affect you some way. I, I could talk about just this item for hours, so if you want to do it, find me on the coffee table. I want some high availability or at least some better availability than I have now. I still need to think how to do that. But there are other challenges. This is an example of another text-based service that was running since 88 this time. It ran for 30 years before dying. It was called Federation, it was very popular on the United Kingdom at some point because when BBC was creating their first, um, before the internet when you could connect to their own BBSs and they have the educational services and so on, BBC actually had um, um, an agreement with the guys that did Federation to have that and that's how Federation was born out of the internet but in the connected world and then it came to the internet and so on, but it was very old technology and very old code. In 2018, they announced we are going to close and when they announced it, they said why. And this is, this is not my ideas, this is their reasoning, why did they close? Uh, they said that security requirements have changes and really, I, I'm talking about the service that people connect via Telnet, so you see that really, security is a different world uh, nowadays. They had problems with the fact that they needed HTTPS because everyone now needs HTTPS and they didn't know how to implement it within the infra infrastructure, the 30 years old infrastructure that they have. Um, then there are GDPR rules and they had to complain, be compliant with them, and they didn't even know where to start. Uh, their hosting service was going to shut down, so they would need to move to another hosting service. Remember, this is not a service that was born to the internet, it evolved to the internet, so replicating this infrastructure and thinking, okay, let's just get a new server and migrate everything to here, it doesn't work like that. And they didn't really even have anyone technical, technically capable of doing so. They would need to ask someone to do it, because, uh, to study their very old infrastructure to then do it. Um, and they knew that they needed a rewrite. For networking and security purposes, they really needed a rewrite. When this service was created, and in their three or four iterations, it ran on AOL, it ran on several different services where they didn't uh, take care of logins. The users were arriving to the service already logged in and identified. So when they had to move to the internet, they hacked something just to have logins and map to the old users and so on, but there's no uh, plan, there was no planning or, or anything like that in there. Um, they needed to support IPv6. <laughs> and to be honest, I believe this, this 
last one to be the biggest one. They were two guys from three. And those two guys were 70 and 60. They are tired. They don't have time. They have health issues. They don't have the force and the will to, do, to still go on. If I had the luck, I, I told you the story of something for, that is running for 27 years, but it started when I was eight years old. And it changed hands from Loop and Goth to Novisu to uh, Bleak to many names I could name in here until, until it got into my hands. And if I don't want to be faced with this challenge, I will need to find someone younger <laughs> to one day I, uh, I say, okay, take care of this. I don't have the mindset to do this because one thing I am sure, this is running for 27 years and I want to do a talk when it reaches 50 years and at that time I, I will do a talk about this service again. But I don't want this to die. Um, other challenges, well, I would really like to believe in a future where everything is, is decentralized. I really want to find a serverless service way of creating a virtual world. I believe we have already the means to do so. So it's something I've been thinking about for this particular service for more than 10 years, but now I, I actually started to write some codes and open some missions and some open source projects because I believe now we have the actual capabilities to do so. This presentation is ending. I just want to make a disclaimer since we are on UbuCon, this presentation is not following the uh, UbuCon template because it's not using the Ubuntu fonts. And it's not using the Ubuntu font because unfortunately and very sadly, I found out while I was doing this presentation that Ubuntu font is not free. What the hell, guys? <laughs> the Ubuntu font is not free and this is an issue stating so and confirming so from 2013. So I'm not the only one dealing with issues with a long time, the Ubuntu community should deal with this. 2013, please find a way to close this issue. It's, it's sad that the Ubuntu font is not a free font. Thank you. I know that we have very little time because I spoke a lot more, but if you have, okay. So, questions. Go ahead. Uh, how much uh, can, uh, did your, your previous Raspberry Pis uh, run? They run 24-7, right? Yeah, they are always running. Sorry, in the integration. Ah, okay. So the... How much how much time uh, does uh, Raspberry, can a Raspberry Pi go on <laughs> running 24-7? Okay, so the, the question is, uh, this is running currently on uh, Raspberry Pi version 1. Uh, and it's not the first one. The question is, is this uh, server running 24-7? And if so, how long does it take for the server to burn out? Yeah. So as I said, every server until now, uh, every of the two Raspberry Pis that I've used for, not for reasons of the first burning out, the first one was perfectly cool. They both uh, stopped working always in the same thing, which is they, um, they burn out their flashes. Uh, so actually, I would think that if that wasn't a problem, they would run for a, lo a lot more. But they are... Resides mostly on the flash drive. Yeah, yes. Okay. But I don't... Th this server doesn't particularly, particularly have too, much, too many writes. So it's, it's re and I saw other people complaining on other, um, using Raspberry Pis for other things that the first version really has some problem and really burns out many of them. 
this has been burning, I, I don't want to lie, but I think that is burning more or less one per year. But it's not very, precise. it's not precise. And after the first two ones, I decided to only use very expensive and supposedly good flashes to make sure it's not their fault. But still, once per year, everything stops. Uh, no rights. So, uh, I, uh, we'll ask you uh, before you present that slide. Why not a generalized uh, network? So I run a node. You are. You are oh yeah. Node. We uh, we can talk about. Guys this. are a node, and it is in, this is uh, the probability of the network uh, came down. It's uh, yeah. It's very difficult because yeah. Yeah. I well, think that is a really good uh, question about that. Yeah. yeah, so basically, well, I, I also said that I wanted to deal with a high availability. When one of the things I would like to have is to have different services, servers in different places and they would be connected. So if one goes down, the other yeah, is yeah. running. But when I'm talking about decentralized, and I'm talking about no servers at all. I want the client to be enough to talk with other clients, and together they agree on what's the state of the world at that time, and that's the virtual world. So as long as you have someone running it, you have it going on. And it is possible. We have. We have already the models for a GNU internet, which is totally decentralized, and it's possible. But this would be this would be actually a nice topic for a talk on its own, and I might do one sometime. If if you are curious about this, go to cqshare.org which is a nice starting point. Or, well, I have these slides on GitHub. You can see the comment for this particular slide has the link where I took this graphic from, and it has a long explanation of how to actually create a decentralized future and a new internet. It's, that's it. Thank you. If anyone has more questions, we can talk outside. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.